Okay, well, last time I spoke about the genesis of Babylon 5, and now we're going to go, not necessarily into the series as such, because this is the pilot movie. And in many ways, it's kind of separate from the actual series, although there are a lot of points and events that take place in this that will be reflected as the series gets going. But in a lot of ways, it's kind of uh, almost a standalone episode come film on its own. I mean, basically, the pilot movie that would lead into the series should have been commissioned. The Gathering, originally just called Babylon 5 before it was clear there would even be a series, is important in many ways. Its plot sets up the backdrop to the series and introduces us to many of its characters, even if some of those would not last beyond this film. It hints at the very beginnings of a deeper story. And even from this standalone movie, you can see the depth and intricacy of JMS's writing. So that it would have been a shame, indeed a crime, had the series not been taken up. But happily it was, and the rest is television history. <coughs> so we begin with the <coughs> characters and cast as they were um, in the movie. Um, some actors and indeed some characters were changed, although... Generally speaking, most of the people here did go forward onto the series, at least for the first season. So, you had Michael O'Hare, who has sadly passed away, as Commander Geoffrey Sinclair. Jerry Doyle as Chief Michael Garibaldi. And then you had Mira Furlan as Ambassador Delenn. Tamlin Tamita as Lieutenant Laurel Takashima did not last beyond the movie. She was replaced by Claudia Christian, who then played Commander Susan Ivanova. So, not only was it an actress change, it was a complete character change. Uh, Andres Katsulas, uh, unfortunately again, passed away, no longer with us, as the incredible Ambassador Jakar. And Johnny Saka, as Dr. Benjamin Kyle, again, he did not go forward to the series. He was replaced by Richard Biggs who again, unfortunately, passed away. Rest in peace. Uh, and he played at Babylon 5 Station's Dr. Stephen Franklin. Uh, Peter Jurassic as Ambassador Lando Malari is another one who would totally shine and would certainly go through right through to the series. Then, <coughs> that would be the... <coughs> excuse me, that would be the main uh, cast as such. Then, there were sort of other... Not so important, but possibly important to the movie, but certainly not to the series uh, as such. Uh, and that was Blair Barron as Carolyn Sykes. Now, she was actually replaced by Julia Nixon's soul, and her character was changed to Catherine Sakai, um, both of which were supposed to be Sinclair's girlfriends. Um, not that I'm saying he had two girlfriends, but the character was changed. I think maybe he did have two girlfriends, I don't know, but Catherine Sakai was the one who basically went through into the series, although she didn't last terribly long. Uh, John Fleck as Del Varner, he was never seen again, he's the, well, not quite the bad guy here, but sort of the, the main uh, protagonist against which the rest of them sort of, you know, they chase him around the station and stuff. Well, they don't, uh, you, you'll hear as it goes on. Uh, Peter Hampton as a senator, never seen again, although there were plenty of other senators. And Patric Patricia Tallman as Lita Alexander, she was replaced for seasons 1 and 2 by Andrew Thompson as Babylon 5's on-site telepath. But Lita returns from the end of season 2 and features quite prominently, if sporadically, during the 4th and 5th seasons. Okay, before I go on, let me just clarify what I was saying about Del Varner. Um was a little bit unclear although he's essentially the bad guy in this film as we would find out as Babylon 5 got going usually people like him are little people and they are controlled by much higher and darker forces so although Del Werner is responsible for what happens he's not the one who orchestrates it as we'll see as the film gets going Anyway, that is basically the cast list and character list. So, 
as the film opens the year is 2257. Mankind has made contact with alien races and moved out into the galaxy mostly by way of jump gates, technology shared with them by the Centauri, a much advanced race, and have built a space station which they call Babylon 5 in neutral space. Here all races are welcome. It's a trading post, jumping off point, conference centre, diplomatic post and holiday destination for humans and aliens and an important factor in keeping the uneasy peace between the various races. Babylons 1 through 4 have all suffered various untimely demises, with the final station prior to this Babylon 4 actually vanishing 24 hours after going online. This small snippet of information is an example of a seemingly offhand remark that will turn out to have massive importance as both season 1 and 3 come to a close. There are five main races in this part of the galaxy including humans and they are the superpowers that run things. They are vastly different each with their own, their own ideology, traditions, history and outlook and while some are content to live in peace there are old wounds that are festering between others, wounds which will not heal and which will all too soon plunge this sector of the galaxy into war. For now though a quick look at each of these aliens. So we start off with the Mimbari, without question the most logical, spiritual and coldly clinical race, the Mimbari revere life and peace, but are nevertheless divided into three classes or castes, worker, warrior and religious. They have just come off the back of a vicious war with humankind, during which Earth itself was almost overwhelmed, but for the fact that the Mimbari, with victory within their grasp and all opposition to them smashed, mysteriously surrendered at what came to be known as the Battle of the Line, Earth's last stand against the implacable enemy. The reason they halted hostilities will become clear and again have a huge and profound effect on the story arc later on. When we meet them in the gathering they seem more observational than confrontational, almost monk-like, as if they're waiting for some great event to unfold. Then you have the Narn. Looking like reptilian humanoids, the Narn are a proud race of mighty warriors, but not so long ago were subjugated by their old enemy, the Centauri who enslaved them for years, raping their planet and stripping it of all its resources, leaving the Narns far behind in terms of technology. Due to their treatment at the hands of the Centauri, the Narns are out for revenge and will side with anyone against their old oppressors. They are also trying to gain any technological or military advantage that would allow them to strike back and hopefully wipe out the Centauri. And the Centauri themselves are an ancient race of people whose lifestyles and traditions seem to be based on that of the Roman Empire of Antiquity. They are fallen people, they still have power but they used to command a vast empire which has shrunk as their influence in the galaxy has waned. They long for the old days and keep an abiding hatred and contempt of the Narn in their hearts. Their other desire being the elimination of the whole race which they consider inferior. The Centauri were the ones who sold Jumpgate tech to the humans and so are essentially their oldest and closest allies among the five races. They see the humans as less evolved, younger versions of themselves when they were at the height of their power. Finally we have the Vorlons, a mysterious race cloaked in secrecy and rumour, no one has ever seen a Vorlon. They leave their home planet but seldom and when they do, always wear a bulky encounter suit, as the atmosphere of other planets is lethal to them. At the time this takes place, hardly anything is known about the Vorlons and legends about them include one which holds that if anyone sees a Vorlon without his encounter suit, they will turn to stone. As the movie opens, Station Commander Jeffrey Sinclair is waiting to welcome a Vorlon as the fourth ambassador to Babylon 5. The first rate race we meet, however, is of the Narn, a man called Jakar, who is in fact the Narn ambassador to the station. He comes across as belligerent and pushy, a thoroughly nasty fellow. The station's resident telepath arrives and greets Sinclair. Her name is Lita Alexander, and through her induction to the station, we learn various things, such as that the aliens resident on the station have their own sector, which is Green Sector, where their quarters can be maintained with the correct mix of atmosphere and gravity to allow them to live safely. Sinclair Security Chief Michael Garibaldi opines that he does not trust telepaths. This will become a recurring theme throughout the series. The arrival of the Ambassador from Vorlon, like some of the races here, their homeworld is the same name as their race occurs unexpectedly as a ship comes through the jump gate early and Sinclair goes to meet him alone. However, when he extends his hand to greet the ambassador, the alien falls down and is rushed to Medlab. 
Fearing that the ambassador may die, thus provoking a lethal response from his government, Dr. Benjamin Kyle, chief medical officer on the station, asks Lita to scan the Vorlon's mind telepathically. She is reluctant, as firstly, scanning without a person's permission or consent is against the law, and she could be thrown out of PSYCOR, the body which regulates, trains and employs all telepaths. And secondly, this could conceivably be seen as a hostile act, the invasion of the privacy of an alien ambassador's mind, the breaking of diplomatic immunity in its most literal sense. However, when the alternatives are put to her, she has no choice but to agree and is shocked to see in Ambassador Kosh's mind the picture of Sinclair poisoning him by attaching a small disc to his exposed hand. With such irrefutable evidence, a trial is convened and Sinclair is relieved of duty. Unconvinced, however, Garibaldi, who is his friend and served with him on the Mars colonies and who got the job here from the commander, investigates to see if there's another answer. Meanwhile, the politics and power plays that drive and characterise Babylon 5 come to the fore, as representatives jockey for position, eventually voting to allow Sinclair to be extradited to Vorlan to stand trial for murder. But Garibaldi is interested in a traveller who came aboard at the same time as Lita, a man called Del Varner, who is a petty thief and smuggler wanted in several systems. He breaks into the man's quarters, but is shocked and annoyed to find Varner dead. So much for that lead. However, as he tries to figure out a new strategy, it seems that Lita is in med lab trying to finish Kosh off by turning off his life support before Dr. Kyle catches her. As she runs off, though, she walks in the door and it's obvious that there is an imposter on the station. More or less confined to quarters, Sinclair tells Carolyn about the Battle of the Line and his part in it. He tells her that as the battle reached its height, he decided to ram one of the Mimbari cruisers, determined to take one of them with him. But he blacked out, and when he came to, it was 24 hours later and the war was over. The Mimbari had unaccountably surrendered, and no one has ever been able to say why. Looking further into the dead smuggler's records, Garibaldi discovers that he had been trafficking in specialised items, and his last run had taken him to the Antari sector, where he had got his hands on a changeling net, a portable force field that allows one to bend images around it, essentially enabling them to take on any shape or form they wish, including that of the commander. So it wasn't Sinclair who had poisoned Kosh, as Garibaldi had been sure anyway, but Varner using the changeling net to look like him. But Varner is dead, so who killed him and why? Had he an accomplice, a second suspect who even now is running around the station, probably at this point trying to get off it. He has Takashima use the station scanners to pinpoint the huge energy signature the changeling net would put out, and they discover that there is indeed a second man, or rather an alien an assassin from a Mimbari warrior caste, who once they have overpowered him tells Sinclair, you have a hole in your mind. That cryptic remark resonates with the commander as he knows that there is a 24 hour period that he can't account for during the Battle of the Line. It's a phrase that will come back to haunt him and lead to a massive development and finally revelation as the series progresses. Once Sinclair's innocence is established then, everything for now goes back to normal and the massive station with the recovered ambassador Kosh installed as its final representative is open for business. So that's the story, the plot line of the opening movie before the series itself gets going. Now here I want to look at various aspects of the show which I will be uh, speaking about in under certain headings. The first of them is important plot arc points. This is where I will refer to scenes, people, quotes, occurrences, anything that will later have a large impact on future episodes and or seasons. I'll rate them from green through orange to red, which will correspond to their importance and how they influence the series and the plot as a whole. If in later seasons they tie into a previous plot, I'll reference that. And the first of these is the Battle of the Line, with an arc level of orange. The final defence of Earth from the attacking Minbari war fleet, the Battle of the Line was the last stand against the invasion fleet. It has gone down in human and Minbar and other history as one of the bravest and yet most futile actions ever, and yet it worked, or seemed to, as the attacking fleet stopped short of destroying Earth and in fact surrendered. Many who were there at the time believed something else happened. They know they were outmanned and outgunned and were losing, had lost the war. 
There was no reason why an enemy vastly superior on the very cusp of victory would suddenly decide to end hostilities. Sinclair would later say, maybe God blinked, but the truth will turn out to be very much more stunning and unbelievable than that. Narn vs Centauri with an arc level of red. The enmity between the Narn and the Centauri, the oppressed against the oppressor, the conquered for the conquerors, is an old wound that is still fresh. It means no Narn would ever trust the Centauri and very much vice versa. The Centauri see the Narn as vile, backward, subhuman beings who are only good as slaves. And though they were eventually forced off Narn in a war of attrition, they still consider the planet theirs. They do not accept that they were defeated, merely that it became too expensive to be worth staying. The relationship between the two races will form a pivotal strand of the plot, and in a tremendous piece of writing, our attitudes towards and opinion of each race will change radically as the seasons progress. Vorlons, arc level, red. Though having an almost peripheral role in this pilot movie, the mysterious and enigmatic Vorlons will become the puppet masters of the second and third seasons, leading into the fourth, and will become more entangled in and important to the fates of not only humans, but all races. And this next one is under, well, it's a triple, really. It's Lita, Alexander, Telepaths and Psychor, all in one, and it's an arc level of red. Although Lita is replaced for seasons one and two by another telepath, the role of their parent organisation, the dark and shadowy Orwellian Psychor, will become more pronounced and deep as it insinuates itself into the life of the station and makes its own plans for using certain members of its staff, resulting in a massive power struggle that will have cataclysmic consequences down the line. And finally, you have a hole in your mind. And again, arc level is red. The seemingly incomprehensible and unimportant remark will impact hugely on the truth between the battle of the line, behind the battle of the line, why the Minvari surrendered, and why Commander Jeffrey Sinclair is key not only to the fate of humans but also to the rest of the galaxy. However, we will not find out exactly why until close to the end of season three in an explosive revelation. Some examples of the dialogue in Babylon 5, some of the best lines. Commander Sinclair turns to a tourist about to make an uh, assassination with a girl alien. He says, I wouldn't, you know the rules about crossing species, stick with the list. A tourist says to him, what are you, a bigot or something? Sinclair says, no, but you've obviously never met an Arnassian before. After they've finished, they eat their mate. Ambassador Lando Malari says to Garibaldi, You make very good sharks, Mr Garibaldi. We were pretty good sharks too once, but somehow, along the way, we forgot how to bite. And then after Garibaldi has departed, almost to himself, See the great Centauri Republic, open 9 to 5, Earth time. Ambassador Jakar speaks to Lita about the possibility of creating a race of Narn telepaths. Would you prefer to be conscious or unconscious during the mating, he asks. I would prefer conscious, but I don't know what your pleasure threshold is. And then of course there's questions. Babylon 5 is full of them, most of which are answered but many of which are not answered for a long time. So it really is the sort of series that you've got to dedicate yourself to. Why does Delanus abstain from the vote to extradite Sinclair to the Vorlon homeworld? I didn't mention it in the synopsis, but she does that. When they're voting to see whether or not Sinclair should be extradited, she could make the difference by voting against it but she actually abstains. When she says she's here merely to observe, what's she watching? What was the Mimbari assassin's involvement with your car? Why does he meet him in the alien sector where he tells the killer there's been a complication? What has he to gain from the assassination of Ambassador Kosh? Was there a connection between the fact that the poison used on Kosh can only be found in the one sector from which Carolyn had returned? 
Was it merely coincidence that she arrived at the station 20 minutes before the assassination attempt? Astor Carr tried to swing the blame towards Sinclair via Carl. What really happened to Sinclair at the Battle of the Line? That's an important one. What did Dr. Kyle see in her cautious encounter suit? Another important one. All, as I say, questions which will eventually be answered, but not for a while. So that ends my look at The Gathering, the pilot movie for Babylon 5. And in the next video I'll be looking at the first episodes of Season 1. Again, thanks for listening and I hope you're enjoying it. Bye for now.